From the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, we hear the words of God, quote, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered, End quote. Jesus Christ is the inaugurator of this new heaven and earth, this utopia. Jesus is the first fruits of a renovated humanity in which evil, sin, and death give way to goodness, love, and life. But Jesus is not working alone. St. Paul writes that we Christians are participants in this fresh way of being due to our oneness with Christ. Quote, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. End quote. But what exactly is the old? And what is the new? And how do we move from the old to the new historically? Ignacio E. Correa, with some comparative input by Ernesto Che Guevara, helps us answer these questions today in part two of our two-part series on the Jesuit martyr's essay, Utopia and Prophecy. This is the Liberation Theology Podcast, a close look at the basic concepts of Latin American liberation theology. I'm your host, David Inchauskas. Friends, comrades, siblings in Christ, good morning, afternoon, or evening to you wherever you may be, wherever you may be listening. It's a joy to be back as we continue to look into Ea Korea's writings on utopia and prophecy. We'll recall from last episode that prophecy makes clear the gap between our present reality and our utopic destination, and that the Christian understanding of utopia is rooted in Jesus' past historical preaching and action on the reign of God and in our present reading of the call of the Spirit in the signs of the times. And we'll recall that prophets lead us to take concrete steps to breach the gap between our unjust now and our future life of solidarity. And for more on all that, check out our last episode. For now, though, we'll move into a discussion of Ea Korea's liberationist Christian vision of the new human being, the new earth, and the new heavens that constitute the utopia that beckons us. And since I found quite a bit of resonance between Ea Korea's idea of the new human being and Che Guevara's idea of the new human being, put forth in his monumental 1965 piece Socialism and the Human Being in Cuba, we'll conclude with some remarks that put these great prophets in conversation with each other. And of course, along the way, some personal experiences and current events will flesh out what Ea Korea is saying, in particular a commentary on Afghanistan. It's an excellent episode with some really stellar content, so you won't want to miss it. Let's get right to it. Before we can talk about the new man, the historicized ideal, it's good to ponder the old man, the thing that we're seeking to negate and transcend. And we're not talking about the old man, your Gen X dad or your boomer grandpa, though some of the traits I'll mention might coincide with these folks. We're talking about the fallen Adam, the human person enmeshed in a world of oppression, of alienation from God and from one another. We're talking about the logic of the oppressors, their psychology, their personality, their hollow justifications for their evil actions. Ea Korea, in a stunning paragraph of acute perceptiveness, lists 13 traits that characterize the old man. Insecurity, self-defense, irrationality, lack of solidarity, ethnocentrism, absolutizing and idolizing of the nation's state, exploitation, domination, superficiality of existence, superficiality of the means of choosing work, immature pursuit of happiness via pleasure, pretentiousness and aggression towards nature. I want to talk about a few of these characteristics in terms
terms of the recent history of the United States. How about insecurity, self-defense, and irrationality taken together in terms of the war on terror, an especially relevant topic given the recent U.S. withdrawal and chaos in Afghanistan? Indeed, the event that initiated the war on terror, at least this phase of it, was the tragedy of 9-11. I remember it well. It was a horrifying day on which 19 members of Al-Qaeda murdered 2,977 people, and there is no denying the evil of this event. What I want to question is the U.S. response to this event. Tapping into the understandable insecurity and self-defense instincts in the American people, the ruling class justified an irrational use of force. Why irrational? The U.S. response violates all four conditions of the Catholic just war theory, which, though there are serious objections to this theory, some of which I myself hold, it does provide some important rational grounds for a discussion of the use of violence. The first condition states that, quote, the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain, end quote. While the damage of 9-11 was undoubtedly grave, there is reasonable doubt about the lasting and certain nature of the damage. In fact, the only certain and lasting component of the 9-11 attack was the U.S. response. The events of a few hours resulted in a war of 20 years. The second condition claims that, quote, all other means of putting an end to aggression must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective, end quote. It's not reasonable to hold that all other means were tried between September 11th, 2001, and the Congressional Authorization of Force on September 18th, 2001. 2001, just one week later. The third condition reads that, quote, there must be serious prospects of success, end quote. Recent events demonstrate that though many attempts were made to indicate to the American people that success, whatever success meant, according to the yes, one page authorization of force joint resolution framed in the broadest way possible, success did not come in the long term, though it's true that U.S. troops killed Osama bin Laden 10 years later. The fourth condition says that, quote, the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated, end quote. And here's where the U.S. response is especially grievous, sickening, depressing, infuriating. According to the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, quote, over 801,000 people have died in the post-9-11 wars due to direct violence and several times as many due to the reverberating effects of war, over 335,000 civilians have been killed as a result of the fighting, and about 38 million have become war refugees or internally displaced persons, end quote. So that's about 3,000 people dying in the events of 9-11 and 800,000 people dying due to the U.S. response to 9-11. And that 800,000 number does not include the so-called indirect casualties, which number in the millions. Yes, we should talk about national security and self-defense, but whose national security and self-defense? Because the value of an Afghan, Iraqi, or Pakistani life is not less than that of a U.S. life, yet according to many politicians and news media figures, it seems like that's the case. They will talk about the relatively small number of U.S. military personnel lost in the war on terror. Yes, important, lives lost. But they will not discuss the staggering numbers of lives lost for which the United States is squarely to blame. That blood cries out to heaven as an abomination in the sight of the Lord. And I remember my preteen and teenage years growing up in the midst of this conflict. I remember the frequent speeches from President Bush about strategies and surges. I would sit on the ground 
stand in front of the television, and even at times, I would imagine myself as an Air Force pilot contributing to the U.S. war effort. And recalling these things, it fills me first with sadness. I was totally oblivious at that time to the one-sidedness of the dominant narrative, oblivious to the human costs of the war. It was not until graduate school that I had a chance to study the war on terror in great depth and to discover the horror, with horror, the disproportionate nature of the U.S. response. And second, reflecting on these experiences in my youth, it fills me with rage how easy it was for the ruling class and the news media to concoct a narrative that the U.S. public would eagerly embrace. How easy it is, given that we are seeing this history repeat itself in the present. Marines help Afghan women escape from the Taliban regime. They secure the airport. They pass out food and water. But how many Afghan women have been killed due to the U.S. response to 9-11? Is it tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands? How many Afghan women have been displaced due to the U.S war? Is it hundreds of thousands or millions? The images on the evening news are moving. They break my heart, but they are not the whole story, and they are not wrestling with the U.S. culpability in the slightest. Indeed, I could go through each one of the 13 traits of the old man that Aikaria lists and relate them to the war on terror, but we'll stop there. It really is maddening. Some folks try to justify the traits of the old man by claiming that that's just how human nature is. Aikaria thinks not. Quote, when Hobbes in 1651 wrote in the Leviathan that there were three causes of fighting among men and that these three were written into human nature, insecurity, competition, and the desire for glory, he was describing the experience of the emerging Western man more than something internal to human nature, end quote. And yes, Hecaria, <laughs> yes, Hobbes, along with many liberal and conservative philosophers of the modern era, who only got nastier when social Darwinism appeared on the scene contend that competition is just inherent in human nature, but perhaps they are projecting. What are we to say of the historical communities outside of the capitalist Northwest who have no notion of private property, whose spirituality makes no distinction between the individual and the collective, whose ecology does not pit humans over and against nature but places humans within the system of nature? Sure, humans need to survive, but cannot the human economy operate in a symbiotic, collaborative way? What of our social animality condemns us to the system of capitalist exploitation. The natural state of insecurity, competition, and vainglory often functions as an ideological superstructure to the capitalist mode of production. No, Hobbes, humans are not necessarily brutish. It's just you. It's just you. When the rich turn from political economy to the gospel, they bring with them their base biases and jaundiced justifications. A. Korea writes that the powerful seek to, quote, reconcile material riches with spiritual poverty, end quote, coming up with excuses for why Jesus is not calling them to surrender their wealth to the poor and come and follow Jesus, just as Jesus said to the rich young man. The tried and true reading of the church is just the opposite of the justification of material riches. Jesus, the church fathers, and the great saints are actually after the, quote, reconciliation of material poverty with spiritual riches, end quote. After the story of the rich young man, the disciples are in awe of the fact that Jesus essentially tells them that a rich person either cannot enter heaven or can only enter heaven with great difficulty, depending on your reading of the passage. They had assumed that God blessed the wealthy with their riches, that riches were a sign of one's heavenly destination. But no, God's ways are not our ways. It's those who are poor or who make themselves poor who will be in heaven. With God, the salvation of the poor is possible. In fact, as liberation theologies like to put it, there is no salvation outside the poor, to whom the reign of God belongs, as Jesus specifies in the Beatitudes. We folks of the 21st century often find ourselves in the situation of the disciples. We think in terms of the culture of wealth, or what Korea calls the civilization of wealth. The way of salvation is the capitalist 
way. We work up to the top through exploitation, repression, and violence. And that's just how it is. You become a company man or a ruthless entrepreneur, and that's how you find success. We are so enculturated into this pattern of thought that we dismiss alternative models as naive. Perhaps we can reform capitalism a little, but other methods of economic organization are just pie in the sky. Get real. That's the old man. That's the dominant perspective. And indeed, Ignacio writes that, quote, wealth does have some possibilities for liberation, end quote. But he also writes that the accumulation of wealth for the few always comes, quote, at the cost of other possibilities of slavery for oneself and others, end quote. I won't uh, belabor this point further. We, we've seen previously that the riches of the few in the colonizing nations have come at the expense of the poverty of the many in the colonized nations. And we readily know that even within capitalist imperial nations, there is vast inequality between the bourgeois owners and the proletarian workers. Salvation will not come from the reproduction of capitalism, from the refinement of capitalism, whose motor is the rate of exploitation. Christian salvation comes from the heart of the world of the oppressed, quote, the privileged place of Christian humanization and divinization, end quote. Jesus was born in Palestine, not Rome, and Jesus is constantly reborn, in the colonized oppressed who seek liberation, not in the imperial core that seeks only to preserve the present arrangement. The new man is defined in part by his active protest and permanent struggle to overcome the dominant structural injustice. The freedom to, quote, give one's life for others, whether in daily untiring dedication or in sacrifice unto death, suffered violently, end quote. The new man's motor is not hate, but mercy and love. Quote, hate can be lucid and effective in the short term, but it is not capable of constructing a really new human being, end quote. Hate can be very good at tearing down, and frankly, there's a lot that needs to be torn down, so that's good. But hate is not very good at building up, and for revolutionary wins to be sustainable, a persistent building up is necessary. Building up happens when there's solidarity, and Christian solidarity happens when there's a three-way alignment towards a common goal. One, the self, two, others, and three, God, laboring towards an end, the end being the reign of God. In this way, our shared purpose, more than the production of a material good, an idol, really, is a certain type of relationship, of community. Loosening the bonds of economic enslavement, the poor with each other, with their allies and with God, dictate the conditions of a new society in which human flourishing is truly at the center. The glory of God is humanity alive, as St. Irenaeus would put it. The new community of solidarity entails a departure from capitalism's exploitative relationship with nature. The old humanity looks down upon nature with a mentality of slavery. Land is owned. Water, ground, plants, animals, all of these have human masters. Nature is commodified and financialized. This human nature relationship of owner property under capitalism is far from St. Francis of Assisi's family relationship of sister, water, and mother earth. Ea Korea notes that it's even farther from indigenous people's relationship with the natural world wherein the idea of land ownership is ludicrous. Nature is to be venerated with filial or divine piety, and humanity is not set over and against nature but rather is integrated within nature. The frame of reference is simply different. So as St. Paul says to the Gentiles, those of us who have adopted the capitalist approach to nature must, quote, put away our former way of life, our old self, corrupt and deluded, and be renewed in the spirit of our minds, clothing ourselves in the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true justice and holiness, end quote. From Ephesians 4, verses 23 to 24.
Following his discussion of a new humanity, Eakriya moves to a commentary on the new earth, which consists of a new economic, social, political, and cultural order. Essentially, we are after a new world, and here Eakriya plays with the European idea of America as the new world. He writes, quote, The so-called new world, far from actually being new, has become, especially in the Latin American subcontinent, an impoverished imitation of the old world, end quote. It's a zinger. In the course of history, Latin America became first a colonial appendage of the old world and second a neo-colonial appendage of the northern new world, which in turn simply reproduces the imperial capitalist exploitation it learned from the old. There's little new about the new world, but there could be. Latin America has extraordinary revolutionary potential which has become active with varying degrees of success. But what does a Latin American theory of a new world, a new earth, look like? It isn't theorizing, isn't and isn't theorizing about it, just pie-in-the-sky speculation. Not necessarily, as it turns out. As Marx writes, quote, Theory becomes material force as soon as it takes possession of the masses, end quote. And Marx insisted on the importance of a correct party line, a robust theory, which often meant a more materially specific and less ideologically abstract position. For instance, in his critique of the Goethe program, Marx criticizes LaSalle's proposal for the proposal for the prohibition of child labor by asserting that it's, quote, absolutely essential to state the age limit, end quote, if one were to impose such a prohibition. And that on the contrary, quote, an early combination of productive labor with education is one of the most potent means for the transformation of present day society, end quote. In short, it's helpful and expedient to have practical theory on the best way to move from the old earth to the new via prophetic action, as Eakriya would put it, or, as Marx would put it, from the capitalist world to a communist one via socialism. Eakriya first looks into the new economic order, and here's his general sketch. The dominant economic model privileges private accumulation at the expense of the universal satisfaction of basic necessities. And we have to Reverse this paradigm. The provision of the basic necessities of nutrition, housing, health, primary education, and work must be the starting point. If we take the metaphor of a dinner table, these basic necessities are currently morsels that fall from the feasting of the rich, and the poor must compete against each other to snatch the little that they can. In the new economic order, these basic necessities will be the centerpiece of the table at which all have a seat. This may mean that as some segments of the economy shift from the production of superfluous luxury goods to the production of basic goods, the middle and upper class will have to forego some commodities to which they are accustomed. Formerly comfortable and wealthy folks will have to live more simply, but Eucharia notes that, quote, the great saints have incessantly preached the Christian and human advantage of material poverty anyways, end quote. Take the case of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the first superior general of the Jesuits, who wrote a letter advising his men to cherish, quote, poverty's retinue, end quote, as far as they can, willfully embracing, quote, poor food, poor clothing, and poor sleeping accommodations, end quote. And let's keep in mind that many of the first Jesuits came from a background of nobility, just as many Jesuits currently come from middle or upper class background. So these words from St. Ignatius of Loyola had a particular revolutionary and countercultural meaning. But what of private property? Will there be private property in the new economy? Eucharia seems to think not. He claims that the churches and St. Thomas Aquinas' teaching on private property is, in fact, a concession due to the, quote, hardness of our hearts, end quote, but that, quote, in the beginning, it was not so, end quote. Eucharia is making a comparison to Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce. Just as Jesus says that God permitted divorce for a time as a concession to humanity's fallen nature, the church is permitting private property for a time. However, the day may come when this teaching is corrected, just as Jesus corrects the teaching of those who permitted divorce in his day. Eucharia then asserts that there's no need for the great goods of nature, air, sea, beaches, mountains, forests, 
forests, rivers, lakes to be privately appropriated, and much less should governments in the colonized and neo-colonized world give concessions of forests, mountains, and rivers to businesses from the colonizing and neo-colonizing countries for the extraction of natural resources and further enrichment of those who are already wealthy. At this point, Korea makes some of his clearest and most poignant remarks in favor of Marxism, stating, quote, Marxism, insofar as it is the great contradictor of the capitalist economic arrangement, insofar as it profoundly attacks the spirit of capitalism and analyzes the mechanisms that sustain it, and insofar as it utopianly proclaims the liberation of human beings through the liberation of labor, plays a long-reaching prophetic and utopian role in Latin America and offers a scientific method for unraveling the profound dynamism of the capitalist system, end quote. We can boil down Aikaria's quote to two points. Marxism is helpful because it, one, provides a vision, a free post-capitalist society, and two, provides a method, an astute analysis of capitalism that signals how it can and will be overcome. At a basic level, liberation theologians are interested in these same questions. Vision, framed in liberation theology as utopia, and method, framed in liberation theology as prophetic action. Inasmuch as Christians are looking to instantiate this utopic reign of God, but need a method to analyze present reality and, from this analysis, construct the reign, Marxism is a fruitful conversation partner from which Christians have much to learn and with which Christians can collaborate on common goals. Nevertheless, Aikria is critical of socialism on one major point. He notes that countries like Nicaragua and Cuba have had difficulties actualizing their socialist ideals. He claims that socialism, quote, doesn't prosper precisely because of its moral idealism, which does not keep in mind the empirical state of human nature. If the new human being were to be attained, the socialist arrangement would function better, end quote. But I'm not sure that Aokaria's critique is accurate. Do historical problems with Nicaragua's and Cuba's revolutionary governments primarily result from a flawed socialist anthropology, as Aokaria su suggests, or do they primarily result from capitalist domination, which has done everything in its power, including military action, to prevent these experiments from succeeding? Given the undeniability of the second option, it's just the case that that the United States has imposed sanctions and has invaded or attempted to invade both of these countries, I don't think that we can independently assess Air Korea's opinion. And of course, it's possible that there are other reasons for historical problems in Nicaragua and Cuba that have little to do with socialist anthropology or economic and military pressure from the United States. It's possible that Air Korea is jumping to a conclusion here that doesn't necessarily follow from the data we have at hand. But aside from this unsatisfactory critique, Aya Korea makes a second comment on the relationship between Marxism and liberation theology, which is rather intriguing. He writes, quote, Liberation theology has on occasion been naive and tolerant towards the theory and practice of Marxism because of a certain inferiority complex before the commitment of the revolutionaries, end quote. Let me expand on this fascinating quote by pointing to a historical phenomenon. Marxist labor organizing caught the church in Europe and Latin America off guard in the 19th and 20th centuries. Marxists made significant inroads with the working class, often at the expense of the church in terms of mass attendance and religious affiliation. Marxists also won economic victories for the working class, victories that the that the church did not win despite the church's presence in these regions for centuries. I think Catholics can and have responded to this situation in two main ways. First, some Catholics have attempted to form Catholic labor unions that would rival the Marxist ones. This movement has largely failed. Second, some Catholics come to see Marxism as a superior worldview because of its capacity to achieve material benefits. Marxism is just better at saving humanity than Christianity, so Christians drop their Christianity and embrace Marxism. In either case, Marxism wins relative to Catholicism, and in many places around the world, indeed, the percentage of the Marxist population has increased and the percentage of the Catholic population has decreased. 
Well, Marxists, like evangelicals, uh, strangely enough, often bring extraordinary energy to their endeavors. In A. Korea's words, they are, quote, committed, end quote. And their total commitment produces success. Faced with Marxist gains, socially committed Catholics feel a sense of inferiority, also probably with evangelical ones. But it appears that Marxists are better organized, that their theory is more precise, and that their people are more energetic. The solution, then, may be a middle road between the aforementioned options, retaining the Catholic faith while also accepting the theory and practice of Marxism on politics and economics. Ea Korea wants to push back against this third way, this solution, or perhaps better put, he wants to nuance it. Christians can have a unique presence in revolutionary struggle. Prophetic, utopic Christian hope can actually act as a leaven in the rising of the bread, the uplifting of the oppressed, Christianity can help Marxism avoid problematic dogmatism, and Marxism can help Christianity do the same. We can work together and we can see that we both have something important to bring to the table. Ea Korea writes, quote, Especially in their practice, Marxists tend toward reductionisms and effectivisms little in accord with the Christian utopian ideal. In turn, the experience of the best of Marxism has served to spur the church and has obliged it to turn to be converted toward radical points in the Christian message that the passage of years and enculturation into capitalist forms had left merely ritualized and ideologized without historical value for individuals and peoples, end quote. Now let's turn to the social and political orders. Ea Korea claims that revolution in the socio-political sphere, quote, taps into the subversive dynamism of Christianity, end quote. We've just spoken of the subversive dynamism of Marxism in the 19th and 20th centuries with respect to labor organizing, but we must not forget the subversive dynamism that characterized the early Christian church as well and the subversive dynamism of individual Christians and groups of Christians throughout the last two millennia. Let's think of the basic subversion of the term gospel. In the Roman Empire, gospel meant the good news of an imperial military victory, and messengers from the Roman Empire would travel throughout the empire to announce the successes of Caesar's army. That's what the gospel meant at the time. But Christianity turned this notion of gospel on its head. Christian good news would not be a victory for the emperor, but a victory for the poor. The Roman gospel was colonial, colonizing, but the Christian gospel was decolonizing. In the words of the Christian gospel, well, the Christian gospel means casting the mighty down from their thrones, sending the rich away empty, lifting up the oppressed from the dung heap, nourishing the poor with good food. Now, the dominant economic system is no longer prisoner of war slavery, but wage slavery, and the dominant political empire is no longer Rome, but the United States. Yet, the Christian task remains subversive, because whether the powerful are Romans or North Americans, slave owners or capitalists, Jesus is inviting his followers to preach blessings to the poor and woe to the rich, and to turn this idealist preaching into concrete action, because hypocrisy is precisely the sin that Jesus lambasts the most. In a world of inequity, Christians will be subversive or they will be hypocrites. Now for the new cultural order, and I would like to speak about the new cultural order in terms of the film Mi Amigo Angel by Sami Kafati, and then incorporating some of the points that Air Korea brings up in this part of the chapter to illustrate what he thinks the new cultural order should be about. But there's one scene in the film that's particularly moving to me, and it's towards the end of the film where Angel's mother asks him to go into the streets of Tegucigalpa in search of his father who has gone out on a drinking bout and is presumably lying on the floor of some bar. And so as Angel is moving through the streets of Tegucigalpa, shoeless, wearing very poor clothing, we hear in the background music, which is pop hits from that age of North America. 
and folks are dancing inside the bars and discotheques as Angel is in the streets searching for his father. And it's a moving scene for me because it makes me think of a moment from my life when I was in Spain. It was my freshman year of college, the second semester I went to study abroad at the University of Salamanca. And I remember Holy Week in this way, is that Holy Week that year was, it coincided with my birthday. All right, so I was turning turning 19 at the time. And I remember it must have been maybe Good Friday. And so I was like, well, let's go out to the bar with my friends and celebrate my birthday. And again, maybe didn't have a very strong uh, Catholic impulse in my life at that time. And so I remember, you know, going for our pregame at a bar and, and getting rather drunk. And then we would begin our club hopping, moving from one club to the next. And as we were in the streets, moving from one club to the next on this Friday night, there were processions in the streets. And in these processions, you saw these gruesome images of Jesus Christ being tortured and killed and crucified and put into the tomb. And this was a shocking thing to me because it made me consider, here I am, you know, someone from the United States, a little bit maybe early Hemingway-esque, and I am just going on these drinking bouts and parties with my friends, yet there, and I have the money to do so, I have the wealth to be able to do so, I have a nice scholarship, good family to support me, and yet so many people in the world are, are just suffering right now, and even my own Catholic faith, you know, which would lead me to want to be in solidarity with Jesus in this moment of his own suffering and death, is leading me into a totally different space. And so it, it was a shocking thing to me, and it really stuck in the back of my mind. And years later, when I drew closer to Christ and to the church, I reflected on that moment. And I think that moment inspired me to be in greater solidarity, not only on Good Friday, but but hopefully perpetually, uh, with Jesus and the suffering poor. And this brings me to what Aecharia talks about culture in terms of entertainment versus happiness. And entertainment is pretty much the dominant mode of culture currently, right? It's the, the Netflix, let me be entertained and uh, binge watch a series for my own enjoyment. It's uh, the use of the arts and theater as almost a distraction, many times taking us away from suffering and death in the world. There are certainly revolutionary plays and films and different things that take us out of that mindset, but those are more few. The dominant is a sexy, wealthy, binge-worthy series. And so Aikaria is challenging that, saying that that's the dominant cultural norm. But in order to move from where we are currently to utopia, cultural forms have to awaken. They have to conscientize humanity, uh, making us aware of what are the social dynamics at play. And hence my work in on film, my work on theater, uh, analyzing how art has the possibility to do that. One more thing on culture, and this is the way that actually liberation theology uh, can act as a cultural force uh, to get people more interested in Christianity in general. I was speaking with a student, a woman, student of color on the campus of Xavier the other day, and I spoke to her a little bit of liberation theology, you know, in the podcast, and she said, I took a theology class at Xavier, and to be honest, liberation theology was the only thing that we covered that was remotely interesting to me. And I say it in this way because it's something that I hear over and over again, which is either one of two things is the case, that because of liberation theology, some folks have more of an openness to Christianity. They, they see in liberation theology a redemptive, good part of Christianity. And then there are other cases, and more radical cases, where liberation theology either, you know, leads people to have a conversion to Christ and to the truth of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or for those Christians who are considering leaving the faith, liberation theology as almost a cultural force, leads people to stay, in fact. They find in it that thing that they can hold on to that leads them to remain Catholic. And so there, Aecharia speaks of the enculturated assimilation of the Christian faith achieved by the liberation theology movement. And in moments like that, I see what Aecharia is saying, and it plays out. It makes sense. <music> Thank you.
Lastly, Aokuria speaks of the new heavens. Most importantly, we have to state up front that for the Christian, heaven and earth have been united in Jesus Christ. And it's the prayer of the Christian for the fullness of this unity to emerge, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, far from seeing heaven solely as a happy afterlife, the liberationist Christian sees, quote, the heavens present in history, end quote. In Christ, God God is with us. That's the meaning of Jesus' title, Emmanuel, God with us. God is present in a special way, of course, in the seven sacraments, and particularly the Mass. But the sacramental life, the outwardness or materiality of grace, goes beyond the rituals. For the Christian, the Church is a sacrament, society is a sacrament, and the universe itself is a sacrament. Because God's influence, God's grace, is unlimited. It extends into all things. In Christ, God is becoming all in all. Our rituals in the order of grace are encounters with God themselves, but also encounters that lead us to deeper levels of love deeper experiences with God and with others. We can think of the burning bush. It's an encounter that Moses has with the living God in the sign of fire, but it leads Moses to actions that liberate God's people, opening up a new stage of freedom in the life of the people. And so we too must wonder whether our rituals, whether our worship, whether our prayer is doing the same. Is it transformative? Arturo Sosa, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, recently wrote a letter to the Jesuits. He speaks about the spiritual exercises and says, Jesuits make the exercises in their 30-day form two times in their Jesuit life and in an eight-day form every year. And that it seems that experientially, sometimes that this retreat does not have the transformative power that we would like it to have. And he wonders why that's the case. And I think Aokuria is asking the same question here. It's, there is grace to be had in the sacramental life of the church, and there's grace to be had in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. But we need to, what Aokuria calls, quote, recover the effectiveness of the word, end quote. And here, regarding the effectiveness, I think that we can turn to the gospel to understand how this is. So Jesus speaks about the sower, right? The parable of the sower. In this parable, the seeds are sown in different places, you know, on path, in the rocky soil. There are seeds that are sown deeply. There are seeds that are sown closer to the to the uh, ground. And there's different experiences that are had, even though the grace is present, all right, that initial grace is present in each of these areas, on the road, on the rocky soil, in the seed that is sown amongst weeds, and on the seed that is sown in the fertile soil. It's not necessarily the case that that seed flourishes in each of those places. And so it is flourished by a true perseverance, by a true perseverance in carrying out the gospel and announcing the good news and living the good news. So too, it must be for us. And so I think we ask in our lives, that seed that has been sown in me through all of these different, these seeds of grace that are planted in my life, are they bearing fruit in revolution? struggle. In other words, am I cooperating with the grace that I have received? The grace that I have received is extraordinary. It is an immense living power of the Holy Spirit residing in us. So in Christ, we can do all things, all things including moving humanity towards the new heavens and the new earth. So it is possible. And the failure does not come from God as God is on our side and God is working with us. But the failure oftentimes comes through our lack of cooperation, through our inappropriate action in the realm of praxis. So is the seed that has been sown in us, is it being watered? Is it growing? Is it bearing fruit?
Let me conclude, as promised, with some comparisons between Che Guevara's understanding of the new human being and Ignacio E. Correa's. Now, Che, in the essay Socialism and the New Human Being in Cuba from 1965, is seeking to answer his critics who are claiming that under communism, the individual is annihilated in the interest of the state. And what he's going to say in response to that is that it's simply not the case in practice, that in practice, the individual and the community exhibit a dialectical relationship to each other. To illustrate this dialectical relationship, Che uses the example of the relationship between Fidel and the masses, that it is sometimes the case that Fidel has an idea that he wants to implement for the advancing of the revolution, and he proposes this idea to the masses, and then the masses say yes to this idea, and then the idea is implemented. Other times, an individual from within the masses has an idea, and they propose this idea to their community. The community takes hold of that idea and proposes it to the revolutionary leadership. The revolutionary leadership likes the idea, thinks that it's good for the masses, and then it is implemented. So the, an idea will emerge for the sake of the common good, and it's worked out dialectically in conversation between the individual, the community, and the revolutionary leadership. But what of the new human being per se? Well, Chase says that the new human being, for one, has the quality of not being done of a product not finished. We don't know 100% what the new human being is going to be like. That is for humanity to decide. And likewise, the liberation theologians offer a similar vision of humanity. Humanity as not being finished. And that's precisely why the scriptures speak of the new person. Humanity in Christ has been given this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift makes human beings children of God. And St. Paul says that the children of God have a certain freedom. We have the freedom of the children of God. This freedom entails a creative potential. And just as God is creator, so too now in Christ, human being is co-creator with God of the future of humanity. And we can think back to the process theology, someone like a Teilhard de Chardin, who says that humanity, and in fact all of creation, is is on an evolutionary journey towards the omega point in which God will be all and all. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what this is going to be, but this future is going to be a co-creation of humanity collaborating with God. Next, curiously, Che <laughs> speaks in terms of new generations being free of the original sin of capitalism. New generations being free of the original sin of capitalism. Curious that Ea Korea as well thinks about the fallen nature of humanity and private property along these terms, that it's the case that currently, because of our fallen state, private property is given as a concession to humanity. But new generations, as we progressively distance ourselves from private property by putting first the common destination of goods. As Catholic social teaching says, we're going to reach a point where the common destination of goods, that culture becomes so strong that there will be no need for the retainment of private property. That original sin, that concession that is given will no longer be there. Next, Che says that the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. It is impossible to imagine an authentic revolutionary without this quality. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why Christians see Che as a positive example of a Marxist revolutionary in that Che had a Marxist humanism. He thought that the revolution should be carried out for the sake of a moral good, and that that moral good was ultimately propelled by a feeling of love for one's human sisters and brothers. And so, to the Christian, in our pursuit of utopia, we are guided in our pursuit of the new heavens and the new earth. We are to be guided by love, not by hate. I think Che here, like Ea Korea, is thinking about about the fact that human beings can achieve some successes in revolutionary movements through hate, but that ultimately
ultimately that hate is not a sustainable way of proceeding. Humanity ultimately needs to be guided by feelings of love and solidarity if revolutionary change is to last. Next, the relationship between our our interior life and our exterior life. Two things that Che says on this matter. Quote, Every day we must fight so that our living love for humanity takes concrete actions. End quote. And so this love, as Ignacio uh, Loyola, <laughs> the first Ignacio, right, would say, is that love is to be shown more in deeds than in words. And the love that we have within us, that we have been given is void if we do not manifest it in concrete actions. Likewise, Chase says, revolution is made by humanity, but humanity must forge day by day its revolutionary spirit. End quote. So revolutionary spirit must be forged. It must be nurtured. And I think that this is where we get in Christianity and in Ignatian spirituality, the idea of the contemplative in action. There is that work of internal reflection, of cultivating within ourselves a revolutionary spirit that must be forged day by day. We have to show up to prayer. We have to show up to our worship together as a community. And that these activities that we do together with God and together with other people are fostering the actions that we are taking towards a more just society. Last, Ea Korea speaks about that table metaphor, whereby the basic necessities of humanity should be the centerpiece of the table and not these morsels that are falling off the table that the poor have to scrap from the table of the rich. And so too, Che says, quote, men who fight to leave the reign of necessity and enter into the reign of freedom, end quote, these are the types of people that we want to be, right? So leaving the reign of necessity entering the realm of freedom. In Utopia and Prophecy, and then previously in Liberty and Liberation, Ea Korea and Juan Luis Segundo are on the same page in saying that liberation proceeds liberty. First, what we have to do is come to a moment in which our society can satisfy the basic needs of all people. Then we can talk about the civil liberties and whatnot that emerge after the conditions of life are guaranteed. And just speaking in the U.S. context, in these days, in amidst the coronavirus pandemic, right, we have people who are being or are going to be evicted from their homes in the situation of pandemic, people who are going through care for their medical needs and yet are going to have to pay for that care and Maybe it will break them and force them to be evicted from their houses. They're going to have to decide, am I going to pay my medical bills or am I going to pay my housing? Let alone, am I going to pay for my university tuition or my loans that I have because education has not been secured? So we have yet to come to a place in the United States in this bastion of capitalist progress. We have yet to come to secure the basic necessities, let alone many of the places that the U.S. capitalist system is exploiting in the neo-colonized world. And so, yes, the goal is to enter into the reign of freedom, right? This reign of God where we can be truly free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. But in order for us to get into the fullness of that place, we have to first secure the basic rights of human beings. And right now, one of two things is the case. One, it's impossible to satisfy those basic needs because greed wants to turn those basic needs into opportunities for capitalist exploitation. Or, let's say we were able to secure some of those basic needs under capitalism. That would only be true because of capitalist exploitation, namely, that it's only because the wealthy are making significantly more than the poor by exploiting the poor that the wealthy are able to afford paying for the basic needs of the masses. So either in the capitalist system, there's going to be exploitation by virtue of those basic needs, 
or there is going to be exploitation for the sake of those basic needs, if we can even get there, which we haven't even gotten there yet in the United States. The reign of necessity, the reign of freedom. This is almost, <laughs> you can just take those words and then put them in the mouths of any liberation theologian, and we think about it in the same way. So I read this essay by Che in light of Air Korea's own comments on the new humanity, the new society, and I wonder where is the contradiction? There, There is none that I can find. These visions coincide, being motivated by love, self-sacrificing for the benefit of the community, securing of the basic rights so that we can construct a future of freedom. These are things that we share. And so, as Air Korea points out, the question for the Christian is how can the Christian collaborate and how can the Christian be 11 in the revolutionary struggle? Thanks for joining this episode of the Liberation Theology Podcast, the last of our two-part series on Ea Korea's Utopia and Prophecy, and also the last of our summer schedule. And I apologize for the lack of episodes. We had one per month over the course of these summer months, but now that we're moving back into the semester at Xavier, I'll be able to produce episodes with greater frequency. We'll have one every other week, and we'll begin having some wonderful guests on the program program as well. Next time, we'll cover Revelation, Faith, and the Signs of the Times by Juan Luis Segundo. We've kind of been ping-ponging back between Segundo and Air Korea, two great folks <laughs> here the last few weeks, and we will continue on with that next time. But for now, let us pray together. And we'll pray the Our Father, just in the sense that Air Korea was speaking about the new heavens and the new earth and when Jesus taught us how to pray, he taught us to pray for that, that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and that God's kingdom would come. So let us pray for the coming of that kingdom and for our own efforts in producing and advancing that coming. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm-hmm.